Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Solar Observatory's live webinar series. Uh, today, we'll be featuring a speaker. His name is Dr. Ivan Millick. Um, Dr. Ivan Millick is a visiting physics faculty member at CU Boulder, where he works on modeling and interpretation of solar spectra and teaches optics. Ivan was born in Serbia about 35 years ago, and this is also where he did his undergraduate and graduate studies. Before, before coming to Boulder, he worked at Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Germany for four years. He enjoys teaching, cooking, warm weather, swimming, video games, and basketball. So with that, here is what hides in the solar spectrum. Hi, Tishana. Uh, thank you. Super happy to be here and super happy to have an opportunity to talk about two favorite things in my uh, scientific life. And these two things are the sun, which is our host star and source of life uh, and very interesting object to study for scientists on one side and spectroscopy as a scientific discipline on the other side. Spectroscopy is in, in one sentence, a uh, scientific discipline which deals with the studies of light. And in astronomy, spectroscopy is what allows us to probe the physical and chemical conditions in uh, other celestial bodies. So not only the sun, but also planets, stars, galaxies, you name it. And my goal today will be to basically try and uh, you know, convene some of this love for spectroscopy that I have and try to show you what we can do with analyzing the light that comes from the sun to us. So let's start with a very, very simple and you know, actually deceivingly simple question which is what color is the sun? I'm gonna give you some half a minute or something like that to write down your answers. And while you're thinking about it and trying to uh, you know, answer this question, I'll try to, to give you some common answers that people would give. Like for example, when we are kids, it is very natural for us to think about the sun as being yellow. And actually, probably if I ask you to, to draw a sun, you would ask me for a yellow crayon or something like that. And there are some very good reasons for that. And I wouldn't blame you if you told me that uh, that sun was yellow. But um, um, and, and sometimes it really does appear yellow. Like, for example, in these beautiful um, you know, pictures of sunset and sunrise, where the sun really does look yellow. But uh, I'm actually curious to see if anybody answered anything. So do we have any feedback, Tishana? Um, yeah, there are some people. We have some comments here, people from all over. Um, Hungary, Idaho. <laughs> uh, Simplio uh, says, says that this was on his mind earlier today. He was thinking about how AIA 171-211-193 wavelengths of light are used to see different layers of the sun. Okay, that's very specific and going <laughs> yeah. ahead the schedule. But here I'm now asking something like much more simple. Yeah, like there's and we... then so now we just got a comment. Um, Osgan Adabali says white. And okay. another person says it depends on what wave frequency. So that's from Paul. Okay, very good, very good. So people here already know a lot, a bit at least about spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, if you manage to leave Earth's atmosphere to somehow go in the space and look at the sun with your, uh, with your eyes, the sun would appear white. You should never ever try to look at the sun directly, not even from the Earth, uh, because it's really strong source of light and it can hurt your eyes. But here is an image from a satellite and the sun really does appear white. So now the naturally comes the question, what kind of color is white, right? We know blue, red, yellow, and so on and so on. And you have probably at least once heard the fact that a white is actually a mixture of all colors. So if I somehow had, uh, you know, colored lights of, of, of different colors and I mix them all together, the resulting light would uh, appear white. But we can also take this argument backwards and we can say that if we find a way to separate the white light into specific colors, we would get like, as you can see in the image here, purple, blue, teal, green, yellow, and so on and so on. And actually this is a picture of uh, maybe the greatest physicist who has ever lived, Isaac Newton, who 
was one of the first people to, you know, let a, a scientific term is disperse the solar light and show that it really contains all the colors there. And what I want to draw attention to here is that look at this, you know, ingenious uh, uh, setup. So he basically has uh, obstruction over his window on the right, and there is only one small hole that the sunlight is coming through. It enters the prism, and then prism is, uh, you know, dispersing sun in the different colors. And you have seen this on the introductory slide. It's also a cover of one of the greatest albums ever made, Dark Side of the Moon by, by Pink Floyd. And, obvious, uh, and Newton did this more than 300 years ago. And then uh, uh, over the time, people were improving further and further the instruments for the dispersion of the light. And actually today we are not using prisms anymore. And one of the people who you know, managed to perfect it and to find something new in the spectra of the sun was a German physicist named Josef von Fraunhofer. And what he did there is that he managed to take, if you want, more detailed spectrum of the sun. And there are two very important things that he noticed there. First one is that there are different amounts of each color in the solar spectrum. So if you look, uh, this actually is the uh, artificially colored, but he, he made an original drawing of the solar spectrum more than 200 years ago. So this graph here on the top actually shows you the, the contribution of all the colors to the solar spectrum. So we see that, for example, there is more yellow and green than blue and red. And this is another reason why I wouldn't blame you if you told me sun is green or sun is yellow or yellowish or something like that. And the other one is that he noticed these, you can't really see them really well here, but just be patient for 30 seconds and an amazing image is coming. Uh, he noticed these little black lines here. It, it, it simply seemed like there is light missing in, in, uh, in, in some colors. And in order to, to have better insight into this, I'm gonna show you my favorite solar spectrum ever recorded. This is done by people at NSOs a few uh, ten decades ago. And this, this requires some explanation. So this is a solar spectrum and uh, it's actually very, very long solar spectrum, which has been folded so that it can fit on, uh, on one slide. So a way to look at this is to start from the, from the bottom left uh, sorry, top left, which is the reddest of the red colors. And then moving to the right, we are moving slowly toward, toward different colors. And then we move to the next and to the next and to the next row. And eventually we are going to reach the bluest of the blue, which is the other side of the spectrum, which is in the, in the bottom right. And here you can clearly see that there are some black smudges in the spectrum. Like if you wish, some tones of the colors are missing. And this is not because of the instrument. This is not because of some errors. This is not because there's something wrong with your screen. There are really these black, uh, black smudges in the spectrum of the sun. There are really some colors missing. OK, so now we're going to move to more technical terminology. And physicists uh, and astronomers refer to different colors as different valence. And valent is, if you want, a way to ascribe a number to a color. And uh, this, uh, this is a consequence of one very shocking physical, physical statement that light behaves in, uh, in many aspects as a wave. And actually, the light that we see is a wave of wavelengths going from roughly 400 to roughly 800 nanometers. But that also means that there are much uh, much, much uh, uh, higher and much lower valence in the, uh, of the light. For example, X-rays are also kind of light, but so are radio waves. And that's actually, for me, that's always really, really shocking to imagine that the light that we see with our eyes is physically the same thing as the radio signals. Uh, ju that just, it's just the wavelength that is different. And basically by the solar spectrum, what we mean is the, the distribution or, or not only solar, by any spectrum, it simply means it's the, the distribution of the amount of light over the valence. And for me, when I was a high school kid interested in, in science, it was, it was really very hard to grasp what do people mean by spectrum. And it always helps me to you know, fall back on some everyday use of the, of the word spectrum, uh, where it usually you know, depicts some sort of variety of things. Like if I was to say that I have a wide spectrum 
of jazz albums, it would mean that I have a lot of different albums there, or a wide variety of, or, or, or a wide spectrum of Magic the Gathering cards. It means that I have a lot of different cards from a lot of different years and so on and so on. So the spectrum is simply, you know, the, the ensemble of all the colors or valence in this context. And now I want to go uh, somewhat deeper in the way that we can look at the world by, by looking, simply selecting different valence of the light. And here is an example from, uh, from the Earth. And what we are looking at here is one and the same human hand seen in visible light on the right and in X-ray on the left. And I think we agree that it's human hand on both of these pictures, but it looks significantly different. On the right uh, image, we see the skin, basically. On the left image, we see the bones. The real question is, why is this so? And this is something that I want to use to sort of emphasize one very important thing about using different valence. And that's the different valence in, in, in general, and especially in astrophysics and solar physics, show us different physical phenomena and different regions, if you want. Somebody, somebody already predicted that I'm gonna be talking about this. So, so in principle here, when we look at the, at the right image, what we see is the light that is being reflected from the sun or from a light bulb or something like that. And we see the, the surface of human hand, right? We see the skin. However, on the left, on the left image, what we actually see is what we actually see is the x-rays that are being transmitted through the human hand. And in this case, the flesh uh, is, is very weakly absorbing these x-rays, while the bones are very good at absorbing this valence. So what we actually see is that we can clearly see where the bones are and what their shape is, thanks to the fact that they're absorbing a lot of x-rays. So one takeaway from this slide, and we are now going to move to the sun, is that by looking at different valence, we look at different physics and different regions and different objects, if you want. And one of the most beautiful images created by one of the most amazing satellites, let's say that way, SDO is this one. And here we see surface of the sun in one moment in time with all these different pizza slices plotted uh, uh, corresponding to different wavelengths. And take some time and, and look at this. So this is one and the same sun seen at different wavelengths. And some of these wavelengths do belong to the, uh, to the optical context. For example, on the far left and on the far right is really how the sun would would look like more or less. But most of these other wavelengths are artificially colored and actually correspond to X-rays. Okay, but what I want you to really notice here is that the solar surface looks different at these different wavelengths. Like in some wavelengths, we see this haze above the surface of the sun, which is basically solar corona. In some of these, we see these loops. In some, we see these brightenings and so on and so on. And this is because different phenomena of different temperatures, pressures, and so on, on and so on, emit light of different wavelengths. And then by selecting specific wavelengths, we see these different, we, we are basically able to isolate and to only focus on these specific phenomena that we see on or above the surface of the sun. And this is, this is really fantastic. This is something that, that you can't really see with your eyes. So most of these valence and most of these objects that you can see here, like for example, these amazing orange or yellowish loops here, you can't, you basically cannot see them with your eyes. It's just thanks to these amazing satellites that can see ultraviolet light that we can see this. And then there is a lot of physics that we can do after this by measuring intensities and the time evolution and so on and so on. But what I want to go back here is I want to go back to these little color caps. I want to go back and see why there is light missing at some wavelength. And now I'm not, uh, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm going to call them the, the way that they're called in science. They're called spectral lines. And you can see here in this very nice example of, uh, of solar spectrum, you can see that they really look like lines because spectrum is usually a band. And there is a very, very narrow part of the spectrum where the light is missing. And these... Um, these gaps do look like lines here. And since we are here, these are actually two of my favorite ones, these yellowish ones here in the center. 
denoted by, by letter D. And there's two of them, but originally to Josef Fraunhofer, again, the same guy who named them, they appeared originally by, by one, uh, as one spectral, as one spectral line here. And now a very important uh, question comes, why are, why are these lines here? Why is some of the light missing? And the first people who actually explain this are another two German scientists, uh, Kirchhoff and Bunsen, who actually figured out something very, very interesting. They figured out that when you take some gas in a laboratory, for example, let's say sodium, and, uh, and you heat it up, it will emit light. Then you can somehow transmit that light through a prism or another dispersing element. And what you will see is completely different from the solar spectrum you will actually see that these gases are emitting only at few very well-defined wavelengths. But then they, uh, they figured out something else. They figured out that if you take that same gas, but cold, put it in front of the white light source, which is here depicted as a light bulb. It's usually not a light bulb, but it can be, why not? Uh, and you let this white light, which is composed of all the wavelengths, go through the cold gas, that cold gas is going to absorb some of the wavelengths. It's going to simply create these, you know, dark lines, spectral lines in the spectrum of this object on the left. And then what they noticed is that the wavelengths where the light is missing in the second case correspond to the wavelengths where the light is being emitted in the first case, which then let people believe another thing. They said, well, if there is light missing in the solar spectrum, then it light has been absorbed by something. And I mean, it's not super obvious, but actually that led them to believe that there is something called solar atmosphere, that the sun is actually you know, surrounded by a cloud of gas that is absorbing at some of these convenient valence. And that what we actually see here that the lack of light that we see around these 2D lines is actually light that has been absorbed by the sodium atoms, the very same sodium atoms that we can study in the lab, that Kirchhoff and Busen studied in the lab. And we know now that indeed these two lines around letter D are two sodium lines, which in a way might mean that sun has salt. Okay, not real. Uh, okay, good. Well, now the next natural question is why do these spectral lines exist? What does it, uh, what does this mean? Where do they come from? Why is the solar atmosphere only absorbing at these very, very well-defined wavelengths? Well, the answer for this lies in, uh, in the very essence of the matter. Okay. And this is not, uh, this is not unusual. Astrophysics is so amazing also because it connects super huge things with really, really small things. And now we have to go back, we have to leave the sun and we have to go to the very structure of the matter, we have to go to the atoms. And people figured out a long time ago that all the matter, gases, liquid, solids are made up on atoms. But then there was a question, how do atoms themselves look like? And for some time, uh, there was a so-called atomic model that depicted atoms as miniature, miniature versions of solar systems that we have a nucleus, which is positively charged, which is in the core. And then we have these little bulbs called electrons that are revolving around. However, that's not exactly true. And uh, there was another ingenious scientist named Niels Bohr, who actually came up with a little bit, uh, with a little bit more elaborate and maybe a bit harder to believe model, but it actually turned out that it's true. What he actually proposed is that these electrons that uh, constitute atoms can't really have any sort of orbit around, uh, around the core. And in a way, the atoms have these sort of energy levels, which are something like steps that you are seeing here on the, on the lower right. And in the same way as, you know, when I'm climbing the stairs, I can't just float in between the two steps. The electrons there, they can't have arbitrary energy there. They can either be on one step and then they can be in the, in the upper, upper one or the lower one, but they can't be anywhere in between, which means that the energies electrons are allowed to have are very, very well defined. And this is something fantastic. This is really, 
Initially, this is really hard to believe. And I can only imagine how people felt more than 100 years ago when Niels Bohr proposed this. But over and over, through hundreds and thousands of experiments, this has been proven to be true. And one consequence of this, and, and what's important for us now, is that if we want to move electron, let's say from a lower to a higher energy level, it means that we have to give it a very, very precise amount of energy. And it turns out that that energy can be deposited via light. And that very specific energy of the light actually corresponds to very specific wavelengths which means that if I shoot a lot of, a, you know, a light of many, many different wavelengths at my sodium atoms, these sodium atoms are only going to absorb these wavelengths that correspond to these energy, if you want, gaps or, you know, steps or jumps in sodium atoms. And this is something that connects now the spectroscopy of huge, you know, cosmic bodies to the, you know, experiments with atoms that we can do in our labs. Which means that these gaps here basically are there because the atoms are very selective in what valence they want to absorb. Okay. So if there is one takeaway that I want you to take away from here is that the spectral lines exist because the light is absorbed at these very well-defined valence that in turn correspond to difference between the energy levels or if you want steps within the atoms. And where is this absorption happening? It's happening in the atmosphere of the sun. For the sun, it's much harder to define the atmosphere because it's not the, uh, like on earth where we have solid core and then gaseous atmosphere. Sun is completely gaseous or if you want uh, made of plasma, but Let's just for now, we can discuss this later, but let's just for now imagine that we can, you know, draw an imaginary line and see, say, this is the surface of the sun and everything above is the atmosphere. Then the presence of the spectral lines means another thing, that at the wavelengths corresponding to the spectral lines, the solar atmosphere is very opaque, while at the other wavelengths where there are no spectral lines, the solar atmosphere is very transparent. Sorry. So we are all more or less familiar with the meaning of words opaque and transparent, but let me just tell you very interesting and for us very useful consequence of something being opaque. So let's imagine that it's a beautiful morning and you are driving somewhere and the air is very clear. And as a consequence of that, you are going to see very, very far away. Right, you're going to see kilometers or tens of kilometers away if the weather is nice. So your, your eyesight simply reaches very far because the air around you is very transparent, so you see everything. And now imagine that for some reason you enter an area with a lot of fog and very, very thick fog. You have to immediately slow down and start driving much more safe. Why? Because your visibility is limited. You are now in a very thick fog, the fog is very opaque, and you see only maybe a few tens of meters away. So you are seeing only the much, much more nearby regions than previous. And very similar thing happens in the atmosphere of the sun when we manage to isolate only the valence that correspond to spectral lines or when we isolate the valence outside of the spectral lines. So this here, what you see now is a chunk of the smaller atmosphere, actually a very, very small one. And this is how the atmosphere, the surface of the sun looks like if we could look at it, the wavelength, very well isolated wavelength outside of any spectral lines. And it looks, uh, actually it looks a little bit as a bubbling water in a, you know, saucepan or something like that. And uh, actually I think if you, if you browse through, through YouTube videos on NSO channel, you might find a video uh, where uh, there was this experiment being actually replicated in a saucepan. And the reason why we see here the surface of the sun is because we are looking through the atmosphere of the sun at one wavelength at, and at that wavelength, the atmosphere of the sun is transparent. So we can see the surface and we can see these bubbly structures that we call granulation. Okay. And now, and, and here you see how, how I, I depicted it is simply that we are looking using telescope along, along this line and we see the very, very deep layers. 
And now we are moving, we are using an instrument and these kinds of instruments are actually, actually exist and we are using them, they're called filter graphs. And now we are tuning our filter graph. We are only selecting the wavelength at the very core of the spectral line where the solar atmosphere is very, very opaque. And now what we see is something completely different. We are seeing if you want clouds or the structures or the haze in the solar atmosphere. We are seeing the solar atmosphere. And technically what we are seeing is just one layer of the solar atmosphere, which is called chromosphere. And by selecting different wavelengths, we could look at the different layers. But this is one very extreme example where I want to show you that the way the solar surface looks, looks like and the atmosphere of the sun looks like, they're completely different. And I have managed to look at these two different layers just by selecting different valence. At different valence, solar atmosphere has different opacity. It is more opaque or less opaque. And in some of the examples, I'm seeing more shallow regions, the higher regions, and at different valence, I'm seeing deeper regions and what we would call here, the surface. And this is, by the way, the data obtained at uh, uh, Dunn Solar Telescope. This is uh, done. Uh, this is done by by our colleague uh, Kevin Reardon. And the spectral line in uh, in question here is famous H alpha spectral line, which originates from uh, neutral hydrogen. So neutral hydrogen is very good at absorbing this light, which is around um, 656.3 nanometers. So it's very good at absorbing red light. And uh, one of the ways to look at this is to look uh, to look at it in uh, in form of a video. And this is actually a GIF that is a little bit twitchy, but I think you're you're seeing it now. So what we are doing here is we are looking at one and the same scene of the sun in more or less exactly the same moment because this scanning is done really, really fast. We are isolating specific wavelengths. And by looking at these specific wavelengths, we are, the surface of the sun, or actually, if you want, the atmosphere of the sun appears completely different to us. And by looking, by selecting these different wavelengths, we are getting insight in the structure and the shape of the solar atmosphere at different depths. And what we do and what I do most of the time is I, I develop quantitative methods that allow us to you know, analyze, uh, analyze these images made at different wavelengths and to extract some physics and some physical quantities from there. And in a way, what I, how I like to think about this is that by looking at different wavelengths close to the spectral line and by selecting these different wavelengths, we can see the all the solar atmosphere going from this bubbly layer that we call photosphere all the way up to the hazy, cloudy chromosphere. And by probing this in depth, we are performing some sort of tomography, which means we are somehow mapping the, not really the whole sun, but the atmosphere of the sun in 3D. And in this case, selecting different wavelengths allows us to probe different depths. This is more or less everything that I wanted to talk to you about today. And uh, uh, I, I only want to end with this amazing image name, uh, made by Inoue Solar Telescope and uh, where we see a lot, a lot of structure and really the resolution and the amount of detail in this image is amazing. And now I want to invite you all to dream and imagine how fantastic this image would look like if we could select very, very fine wavelengths and probe the solar atmosphere in the same way as we just saw how to do in the previous slides. And actually we will be able to do that really, really soon because now in addition to this, let's call it regular camera that is there at the telescope at the moment, we are now getting a lot of very sophisticated science instruments, which are going to allow us to probe the atmosphere of the sun in great detail and very soon within the next year or two, you, are, you will see some scientific results from this telescope that I definitely hope will be amazing. So that's everything that I had for you today. And I would love to hear any questions or comments and any follow up. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Dave Dooling. And I, I believe it refers to the images on the previous slide. And he would like to know 
what depth range do these images cover? Okay, so that is relatively hard to exactly say because uh, the atmosphere of the sun is very corrugated. It's sometimes it's more dense, somewhere it's less dense, and that density is going to also affect the, op the opacity. But uh, we can we can give we can have a rough estimate. So if we set the surface of the sun as the reference. The highest layers that we see here are probably some 2,000 kilometers about, uh, above the, the surface of the sun. And always keep in mind that the sun is huge. So the sun is like 700,000 kilometers in radius. So this small layer of 2,000 kilometers is actually very, very thin that we see above. But by selecting different wavelengths, we can go much higher. For example, you can see that I'm just going to go back to SDO slide. You can see that this image here, we gain access to much, much, okay. How about now? Okay, we, we gain access to much, much higher regions. So tens of thousands of kilometers above. Thanks, Ivan. Great presentation and great response, by the way. Thank you. Another question is, um, here. This is from David Simmons. Mm -hmm. We determined that the absorption was in the solar atmosphere and not Earth's. It's a very good question. <laughs> it will it will take some time to to answer this, but um, that's that's actually very good, and it goes a little bit into into what we do. So, if you if you look at these last slides here. What you see in this in this middle panel here is the distribution of the amount of light with the wavelength, and it uh, it makes uh, it makes some sort of a shape, right? And actually, in this shape, are um, this shape encodes various physical uh, various physical properties of the atmosphere of the sun. And we know, for example, that in order to get this spectral line with this intensity and this shape. Uh, we need temperatures which correspond to few thousands of Kelvin. So in particular, six, seven, eight thousand of Kelvin. We know that it cannot be in the, in the atmosphere of the Earth by that. And actually there is a rule of thumb and that's that uh, when you look at the spectrum uh, plotted as a graph like this, usually the lines that are broad and strong belong to the sun and very, very narrow and well-defined lines belong to the atmosphere of the Earth. But that was a very good remark. And that's actually something to always, uh, to always have in mind is that when you look, when you observe from the ground and you look at the spectrum of the sun, you're gonna see both the spectral lines that originated in the solar atmosphere, as well as the spectral lines that originate in the atmosphere of the Earth. And these uh, spectral lines that originate in the atmosphere of the Earth are called telluric lines, and they're actually very useful for us because they help us calibrate our instruments. Question from uh, Paul Doran. So when you're, I, during the identification of chemical em em elements in the sun uh, through spectroscopy, are the same elements revealed in minimum and maximum solar cycles? Oh, that's a very hard question. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on solar variations per se. And basically these very strong lines that you, for example, see here are practically identical during the minimum and maximum. There are some studies and the ones that I know of are uh, related to lines of uh, mangan manganese lines. However, is that element called uh, originally uh, MN? And it turns out it seems at least that these spectral lines of this element, which are by the way, very, very weak. So you would very, it, it would be very hard to see them in a picture of spectrum like this. Uh, these spectral lines seem to change with the solar cycle. I can't really tell you why. There is something in these spectral lines that is, that is sensitive to these very fine variations because always keep in mind, the temperature of the sun basically doesn't change with the cycle. The, the amount of light that we receive changes by much less than 1%. So, so the changes in the solar atmosphere are very subtle, but it turns out that some of the spectral lines do change. 
but sadly I cannot tell you why because I, I, I don't know and I'm not even sure that people who found it out have a very, very precise answer. Okay, uh, let's do one last question. Sure. What are you most excited to see from the Inoi Solar Telescope as it comes online? Okay, so this is a very, I, I will give a very, I will give a very um, specific answer. It turns out that uh, in addition to measuring the intensity of the spectral lines, so looking how, how the amount of light changes with wavelength, we can also probe another property of light and that property is polarization. And one way to think about the polarization is to think that it's the plane where the light oscillates. So it can oscillate like this, or it can oscillate like this, or mixture of the two and so on and so on. And the polarization encodes information about magnetic fields. So thanks to, the, to our new telescope, we will be able to measure that polarization very precisely and to detect very small amounts of polarization. And what I'm most interested in is to see uh, what's the lowest magnetic field that we can detect with the noise solar telescope. And uh, yeah, that's very specific, but that's what I do. So that's what I'm excited, excited about. Cool, really cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ivan. Thanks for this having me. Great. We had a lot of engagement. Thank you everyone for joining our live webinar series. And until next time, have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.